boys and girls. So today um, I'm figuring out lots of things. I got a new phone and I noticed that one of my videos was in reverse and that didn't work well for me. So I think I fixed it and I'm re-recording this because of that. So today we're going to do the Apothecary and we're going to work on chapter 12. And I just read it, so hopefully I'll read it really clearly this time. And I want to focus today on point of view. From whose point of view is the story being told? And how does this influence our understanding? Because when we hear it from a particular character's perspective, we're hearing their side or their version of the events, right? So that influences what we're going to see and understand about the character telling the story and the characters they tell us about. Just like when you look at history and you look at different points of view in history, that helps you open your mind to different perspectives, ideas, and maybe you won't be as influenced from the one perspective that you hear. So a variety of points of view is always very valuable, but in stories, we usually have one point of view. And so we have to be aware of how does this influence our understanding. So let's see what you think. And normally, I'd ask you whose point of view the book was from earlier in the text. But I'm going with the concept that, since we're on chapter 12, you're very clear as to whose perspective the story is being told by. And if you're not, this is the time to check it out. Have fun. Chapter 12, The Return to the Garden. <clears throat> the one urgent thing we knew from Mr. Shishkin was that the gardener was in danger, and we had to warn him. The physics garden was closed for the night by the time we got to Chelsea, and the gate was padlocked. Benjamin had made his hands into a sling for my foot so I could climb up onto the brick wall. I pulled him up after me, and we dropped down onto the grass below. It was fully dark, and we walked straight from the cor er, corridor of green with the hanging flowers that led to the inner garden. The lushness of the plants seemed sinister in the dark instead of verdant and spring-like. Under the carved Azoth of the philosophers, we peered through the gate. A light was on in the gardener's little house. Hello, Benjamin called. If he's inside, he can't hear us, I said. We climbed that gate too, dropped over, and made our way toward the house. As we passed the sundial in the shadows, I thought it looked strange. The metal triangle that indicated the time was missing. It had been snapped off at the base. I could touch the rough edge of unoxidized copper. How could that happen? We both looked at the house. It seemed innocuous. Now there's a good word. We could look it up. A light burning somewhere inside. We crept quietly toward the door, which, seemed, which stood ajar, leaving a vertical line of light. Should we knock, I asked. Benjamin pushed at the door and it creaked, making both of us jump back. The house was silent. Hello, he called again. He pushed the door open and we stepped inside. I don't like this, I whispered. We should leave. A lantern with a glass shield sat lit on a chair by the door as if someone had planned to take it outside. The gardener's oilcloth coat was hanging on its peg the table was set meticulously for one with a plate, smat, a folded neckcloth napkin, and a white bowl, none of which had been used. There was a wood stove at the other end of the room with a pot on it. Benjamin picked up the lantern and held it over the pot. Some kind of soup had been simmering there, but the fire had gone out in the wood stove and the soup was congealed around the edges. As I moved away from the stove, my foot hit something on the floor, and I bumped into Benjamin, rattling the lantern's glass shield. The spill of light caught the sole of a rubber boot, which I had tripped over. Then, a second boot. I held my breath as Benjamin raised the lantern to reveal two legs in wool trousers, stretched out on the floor, suspenders over a wool shirt, and then the gardener's gray beard. This is not sounding good. A scream caught in my throat. The gardener's shirt was dark with something wet. I started to see spots around the edges of my eyes breaking up the room until I could only see straight ahead. In that small circle of vision, 
I could see the jagged, broken pointer of the sundial sticking out of the gardener's chest. I didn't faint, but fell to my knees beside him. Janie, Benjamin said. I had learned in first aid for junior life-saving that you were never supposed to remove an impaled object because the person might bleed to death. But it seemed unthinkable to leave the horrible thing there, and anyway, he was already dead. I reached for the sundial to pull it out, but a hand, uh, but a hard and calloused hand caught my wrist and gripped it. I screamed. Shh, the gardener whispered, still holding my wrist. His palm felt like it was made of rough bark, as if he had become one of the trees he planted. You're alive, he said. You must run, he said. His voice was faint and hoarse, and his eyes were fixed on me cloudily. Benjamin had crouched beside me on the floor. We have to call for help. No, the gardener said, rousing himself to make the effort. We can't trust police. Why not? He shook his head. I thought of the physics garden outside, all those medicines brought back from all over the world. Isn't there some herb that can make you better, I asked? We can go get it. He squeezed my hand, but I could tell he was weakening. Veritas, he managed to say, the smell of truth. We had come to tell him about it and to tell him he was in danger, but we were too late. We used it, I said, and it worked. Could it help you now? The gardener shook his head. No, he was having trouble breathing and his white eyebrows knitted together in an exhausted frown. Remember, he said, you must allow the possibilities. I would love to know what's going on in the gardener's head. And clearly we are not hearing this from his point of view. So whose point of view is it? And how does that affect the story? And how does that influence us? Very important. Gives you a deeper understanding of the story. And to be aware of the bias, right? The gardener would have a very different point of view. Then his grip on my hand relaxed and his body grew eerily still. Wait, I said, fumbling under his scratchy beard for a pulse. The skin of his throat was loose and still and I felt no pulse, only my own heart pounding. Is he dead? Benjamin asked. I think so. We have to get out of here. I don't think I can move. You have to. Whoever killed him might come back. He pulled me by the hand past the waiting table where the gardener would never eat dinner again and out the open door. We passed the ruined sundial and the Aramis Veritas plant planted in neat green rows. Wait, I said, tugging Benjamin back. I knew the gardener hadn't given up his last breath just to ask if the smell of truth worked. He was trying to tell us something about the herbs. I knelt by the row of leafy plants but saw nothing, so I felt blindly between them and under them, and then my hand touched something smooth and hard. It was a small bottle hidden under the leaves with a piece of paper tied around it with string. He left us something, I said. Take it, Benjamin said, let's go. I put the bottle in my hand and we climbed the fence to the outer garden. The trees seemed to loom and reach for us as we ran toward the outer gate where we clambered over again. I like this phrase and I'm going to share it with you because it's a great example of show and not tell. Okay, see what they're showing us. What's the mood here, the tone? The trees seem to loom and reach for us as we ran toward the outer gate where we clambered over again. Maley Malloy does a wonderful job here of showing us with the description of the trees that this is now feeling sinister and scary and something bad has happened. Even the trees are reaching for them, okay? Very different from her opening description of going to this physics garden, okay? And again, whose point of view is influencing us with that description? Who did Maley Malloy give the job, the responsibility of describing that to us? On the other side in this, Side in the street, I got a stitch in my side from running. I slumped down against the stone wall and felt tears welling up. They killed him because of us, I said, for helping us. Get up, Benjamin said. We don't know that. 
It's true, Shishkin's house was bugged and I talked about the gardener there. It was so stupid. We have to go. We have to tell the police. We can't trust them. We have to tell my parents then. Absolutely not, Benjamin said. There was a murder. They'll have to call the police and we can't do that. But maybe we should, a murder. Oh, Benjamin, it's all my fault. Here, he said, fishing a handkerchief out of his coat pocket. Take this. The handkerchief was white, perfectly pressed, and folded into a square. His fa father must have ironed it, the kind, methodical apothecary. Benjamin was right that we needed to find him. He'd know what to do. I wiped my nose and put the handkerchief in my pocket, where I felt the hard glass. What about the bottle? I asked. First, let's get somewhere safe, Benjamin said. I love the dynamic here because we get to see these two children and the way that they work together like a good detective team. She's um, impulsive right now. Sometimes it's him. And she went back to find that hint under the, the plants, right? And she wants to open it right now. And he's like, no, no, no. We need to be safe. Then we open. So they kind of take turns of being practical. And um, I think that enriches the story. So again, I invite you to think about whose point of view are we hearing the story from? And how does this influence our understanding? How does it change our perspective? How does it set us up for understanding things a certain way? And also, it's kind of fun to think about what if somebody else's point of view was being told, like the gardener or Mr. Shishkin. Okay, so have fun. Read and jot a lot. And I look forward to reading more of the Apocalypse Theory with you. Take care. Bye.